Hello and welcome uh, to this uh, Contact the Family webinar. I'm Gail Walsh from Contact the Family. Uh, some of you will know me. I'm just here with Ben Palmer today who is going to be presenting. Welcome to those of you who have joined us for webinars before. I'm just going to briefly go through some uh, information on how the webinar works for those of you who may be new to the webinar. So just bear with me and then I'll introduce Ben and he can tell you what he's going to be talking about. The webinar today is going to be on short breaks. Uh, hopefully, broadcast will, will go smoothly, but if there is a little bit of a technical hitch, bear with us. Do stay online if we drop off at all, because we'll try and recover that at this end, and hopefully we'll be able to rejoin you very soon. If you're joining by PC, laptop, tablet, or smartphone, you should now be able to see this introduction slide. And what I would say is if anybody is having any problems, um, then you can... Um, contact Helen Reed, who I think her contact details are on your joining instructions, and Helen's available to help with any uh, technical queries if you're having any issues. Or you can um, raise a question. Um, I'm just going to talk to you about that. There are so there, there we've got over 50 people joining us today by webinar, so that's fantastic. So many of you wanted to, to hear Ben. Um, so what we are not able to do is have verbal questions. Um, but what so you will be muted throughout the Ben's presentation. But if you do have questions while you're listening to Ben, you can see, and at the bottom on your screen at the moment, you should be able to see uh, an icon bar, and there's a question mark, which you should be able to see. And you can click on that question, uh, question mark, and type in a query or a question that you have. So if you have a question at any time, you can type that in. What Ben will be doing um, is he won't be answering those questions as they come in. He's going to talk through his information and then there'll be some time for questions and he'll have a look at the questions that come in at the end. Um, we may not be able to answer all the questions, depends on whether they're relevant fully to the webinar. You won't be able to answer questions about specific personal or individual cases. It will be very much forum focused today. Um, so I'll leave you in Ben's capable hands and let him introduce the rest of the topic. If you've got any queries or questions, just pop one on um, any on the question bar to Ruth, who's here with us as well. Okay. Hi, so um, Ben Palmer, and recently joined Contact the Family to work with the Short Break Partnership to support parent care reforms, particularly with regards to Short Break services. Just want to kind of make it clear that um, I'm not a legal expert, I'm not a trained barrister or anything like that, and information within this, although it makes reference to legislation, it should be used for general advice and information only. Um, all of the links that you'll see on the screen underlined um, on the PDF that will be circulated after the presentation should be clickable as well. So if you're looking to, um, if you're looking to kind of go back to that material, then you'll see that there. I think it's also useful, just in terms of clarity, um, to look at some definitions. I appreciate that many of you obviously um, probably have much experience in, the, in this area. So we're going to be covering some material which will be familiar to you, but it's there for reference as well. So that's the that's reason for that. But we won't necessarily dwell on, on a lot of these areas in, in too much detail. So in terms of disability, the most recent point of reference um, this is the Equality Act, which talks about a person being having a disability if they have a physical or mental impairment, and it has a substantial and long-term effect on their capability to um, carry out day-to-day -day activities. In terms of special educational needs, there's obviously been much development um, throughout the SEND reforms, and the definition within that is looking at uh, a child having a learning difficulty or disability which calls for a degree of provision to be made available, and that's from the Children and Families Act 2014. In terms of child and need, this is referencing back to the Children's Act 1989, which has had a number of amendments to it. But it's of most uh, particular importance with regard to short breaks because short breaks tend to be provided through social care services, and in terms of the legislation governing that, that that is the most pertinent. Um, and with this, there are a number of factors which are interesting to consider um, because obviously C is looking at uh, a child having a disability, but it's also, it could include factors around about um, it being unlikely to achieve or maintain a reasonable standard or health or development. So other factors will be 
of consideration in terms of any assessment that families um, have in, in terms of identifying what those needs may be. So short break services is a bit of an ambiguous term. Um, this presentation keeps jumping forwards and backwards, so I'll try and kind of make sure it, it kind of stays on track. Um, but the services that are referred to as short breaks used to be referred to in the past as respite care, and in fact many areas still use that terminology. But throughout the, the changes in legislation and certainly how short breaks, the value of short breaks is, is seen and perceived, it wasn't necessarily necessarily seen as a favourable term. So with, with kind of some sort of connotation that a child would place a burden upon a family. And MINCAP published a report which, which considered this um, one of their breaking point reports. So that when we talk about short breaks, particularly in, in regard to this presentation, we're talking about services which give parent carers a break from those caring responsibilities. But also those that offer children and young people a chance to enjoy normal lives and to be able to go out and enjoy new experiences, make friends and, and look towards achieving some of those ambitions in life. Um, as we've mentioned already, short breaks can be provided by councils. They have a duty to do so, which we'll come on to later. But in most areas, you'll also find um, voluntary organisations who tend to provide some type of short break service, and this could be um, after school clubs or holiday play schemes, and they really do um, families are a really good opportunity to enjoy them. So we're just going to touch on some of the legislation which covers um, the provision of short breaks and, and, and through this I guess we're talking really about those um, which are provided and for who local authorities and councils are responsible to deliver. And um, something which is interesting despite all of the changes in legislation of late a lot of the uh, reference material for short break provision is quite um, well established. So, for example, the Clinically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970 talks about responsibilities to make provision for the welfare of chronically sick and disabled people. And it's aspects of this which govern um, responsibilities for councils to provide short break services. Uh, in terms of whether or not they are obliged to do so means having some sort of process around assessing what those those needs are, particularly to the family and child itself, and to make a provision based upon that. So we're talking around about social care assessments, which could be uh, initial or core assessments of need. And those assessments are tend to be based around the family dynamics, the parenting capacity, and the child's developmental identifies needs in regard to short breaks, then the service must be provided. Much of the resources and information which we are covering throughout this presentation, um, as I said, makes reference to certain things and the links are there, but also there, there are many resources available online which will come towards at the end of the presentation. Every Disabled Child Matters have got a page and, and certain Council for Disabled Children also have got many resources and there's lots of really useful stuff to make use of both in terms of individual cases and also for forums themselves. So in terms of the Children's Act, it's talking about a, a set of additional responsibilities building upon that of the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. And this was amended, this section that you can see on the screen here, by the Children and Young Persons Act in 2008. And it really looking at the, the issues around the issues that families were facing that, that meant that perhaps in some cases they weren't able to continue to care for their child. And what this legislation is covering is looking at what effect does a disability have on, on a child, what opportunities can they have to live lives which are normal as possible, and what help do parent carers um, need in order to be able to continue to provide care or to do so more effectively. And those terms there, effectively, are some of the areas where it's important to get a full understanding of what the needs are by having a quality assessment. The other aspects, which we'll come on to a bit later in terms of the breaks for carers of disabled children regulations, is that a range of services provided is sufficient meeting the needs of families locally. So the population within a particular area and having an, having an understanding of that, the council that is, and being able to provide a range of services which meets those needs. The, one of the reports which 
preceded some of the changes in legislation recently, most notably aiming high, was the Improving Life Chances of Disabled People, which was published in 2005 uh, by Tony Blair's Strategy Office. And it just kind of like acknowledges some of the things which people tend to, you know, you'll, you'll know either from your own experiences or from the families you support. And it's looking at actually all families need a break sometimes, but in terms of families who have children with disabilities, they, they quite often wait a good period of time for a number of reasons to get a short break service. There are also a, a number of particular areas where children perhaps are less able to access short break services, down, whether that's down to the complexity of their needs, some behaviour perhaps, which just means that certain areas aren't necessarily receptive to supporting them. But what's noted about this report and also much of the much of the findings following on from that is that a short break can be the one thing that can just make life more bearable for families and, and help families to continue to look after their children themselves as, as a family unit. So in 2007, based upon much of this findings, the program Aiming High was launched and it was a transformation program that is it was intended to change the way local councils and, and other authorities provided services and it had four particular areas of development, namely short breaks, child care for disabled children, transition and parent forums. It was funded currently by the Department of Children, Families, Schools and the Department of Health um, and there was £680 million allocated initially. What was helpful about this was that it was ring-fenced, so each area had a different amount of funding made available and it was intended for those particular areas only. It was also looking at changing the culture of how people work and to include children and families in terms of how things, how services are developed. And, and that was certainly one of the successes that came through that. And you know, parent care forums are well established now, but a lot of that was, was based upon this work itself. What Aiming High looked at is some of the factors which families who have children with disabilities face, um, notably, high levels of stress, family breakdown, uh, the fact that if there are other children in a the family, they may receive less time and attention, the emotional impact on them themselves, some of the uh, their cares or concerns which they perhaps don't even articulate and the resulting factors which may come about because of that, and just being able to continue to look after their household. These are some quotes which I used to work as a, as a provider um, with a charity delivering short breaks, and these are some quotes which picked out from my time there and and what strikes me about this is these are just normal things and I think that's where a lot of families would say they just want to live a normal life and a short break helps them to do that so to go on holiday to just have a bit of time to get yourself together and, and to help out in that way in terms of children as well short breaks were identified as having a positive impact it's not just about babysitting it's to look at what does that child want to do what they enjoy doing, what support do they need to do that, and, and what do they want to achieve in life. And certainly, um, if we look at some of the quotes which come about from, from that work before, again, it's just normal things, uh, activities which children of any age would, would want to do, to be able to go out with their friends, to be able to try new experiences and to gain confidence, to be able to get your point across, what you think or feel about, and, and, and to be happy as well. So after aiming high, the short breaks regulations, or to give them their full title, the Breaks for Carers of Disabled Children regulations came into effect. And these were uh, additional details which added to the short breaks duty set out in the Children's Act 1989. And they covered three main areas, the duty to make provision of short break services, the types of services which must be provided, and also a requirement to publish a short break services statement and we're just going to cover some of these uh, specific areas. So in terms of provision of services, this kind of provides some detail um, to that section C of the Children's Act and it's talking about the position that families perhaps find themselves in where if they have a child with, with a disability or additional need, what support is needed is something to be able to, to aid them to continue to provide care or to do so more effectively. And then the three bullet points on the screen talk about things um, which, again, are fairly normal things which you would expect people to be able to do without without too much trouble. Um, but, again, families who have a child with additional needs or disability find 
that they're not necessarily able to do that without the provision of a short break. So we've got undertaking education, training or regular leisure activity, looking after other children in the family, and again it uses that term more effectively, or carrying out normal day-to-day -day activities to run a household. The next section within the regulation looks at the types of services which must be provided. Now, the regulations use the term range of services, so that is quite non-descriptive really. It can cover lots of different things, and in fact, um, local councils probably provide support through domiciliary care agencies, um, direct payments, family link, uh, which is where there are foster carers who, who perhaps provide overnight stays for families, and they may have a, a residential house at home, which, which would provide overnights as well, which would be registered with Ofsted to do so. But in addition to that, there are other services tend to be available in, in most areas, which are provided by either private organisations or, or indeed voluntary sector organisations. And that, they're some of the play schemes, the things which we've mentioned already. But what the regulations does do is specify types of services which must be provided. And if you look through that, you'll note it's, it talks about daytime and overnight care, and that's within the home or elsewhere, educational or leisure activities outside of the home, and services available to assist carers. Now, just to pick up on the educational, we're not talking about formal education here, but we're talking about types of activities or services which have a degree of educational content. And that could simply be about learning life skills or learning or, or trying new activities. And again, that crosses over with the leisure activities. So, for example, many of the play schemes may go to activity camps, they may look at particular sports and fairly kind of common um, leisure activities, really. The last point, services to assist carers. Um, again, he's talking perhaps about the timing that the short breaks may take place in the evenings, at weekends, and during the school holidays. Now, I know from speaking to many of the families who access some of the services where I worked before that the school holidays were definitely a particular challenge. Obviously, this year we've got an extended school holidays, and no doubt many, many families are aware of, of the challenge that they may face. And within the school, there's lots of structure and routine, and particularly if children are experiencing you know, complex behaviours or have a particular need with regard to their communication within the school holidays themselves, then that, all of that structure and routine is gone. So it's kind of really identifying the fact that there are certain times when short breaks have a real importance. So the short break statement, and this is one of the areas where forums particularly have had involvement before in terms of being able to work with local authorities and health services to ensure that the information which is within the short break statement is accurate and useful for families and also accessible so what we mean by that is the, the language used, used within it, the format and the layout and the way the information is given to families works. So the short break statement looks at certain areas of responsibility and some short break services may not require an assessment to access and in fact aiming high, that was one of the main purposes or intention, so that families didn't have to go through a social care assessment in order to access a short break and much of the uh, really positive development work that happened as a result of that made it much easier for families to go along. Each area um, did it slightly differently and some areas are better developed than others and that's one of the challenges we're going to look at is well what does it mean now in the times of austerity when some of these services perhaps are being withdrawn because they're not statutory in its entirety because local authorities perhaps will be covering providing a range of services. But the statement is one of the key parts which should contain information for families which sets out details and a range of services that they provide. Importantly, any criteria by which eligibility for those services will be assessed and how the range of services is designed to meet the needs of carers in the area. So if the short break statement doesn't contain details in these areas, then it's, it's going to need to be updated. And that's what it mentions here as well, where appropriate revise the statement. Now, because of the pressures felt through the SEND reform and the work the local authority areas have had to do, short break statements perhaps have not had the same cycle of being kept up to date as, as, as is needed. Services which are designed to meet the needs of carers in their area indicate that local authorities should know what those needs are. And again, there are, there are further duties in, in the new legislation which talk about having that understanding. But actually, duties relating to that go back to Children's Act 1989 and before. Um, the Children's Act talked about having a register of 
children with disabilities in a particular area. And a lot of areas did that, but they weren't necessarily, uh, families weren't necessarily required to do that, and, and therefore it didn't necessarily paint the most accurate um, picture of, of what the needs of families were. So in terms of the statement, any services which are provided by the local authority or commissioned should be designed around what families need to live in that area. The last point on, on this slide talks about local authorities having regard to the views of, care, of carers in their area. So the term have regard is used quite extensively in legislation and it basically has the implication that it should be a given that local authorities are working with families. At the very least, where parent care forums are established and are able to do so, are involved in them in these areas. There are some tools which are useful for reviewing statements. The Delivery Partner Impact, which was one of the one of the partners supporting the Department of Education throughout the development of short breaks, has some tools online which again um, can help ascertain whether or not a statement is, is fit for purpose. So we mentioned one of the other areas in which um, has come out of the SEND reforms um, and also from Aiming High that has been successful, and, and that's notably parent care participation. And you'll see, you know, the ways in which forums have been able to work with areas and develop things like HC plans or local offers that they've been able to do so quite successfully. And in fact, the quote here from Edward Simpson talks about having the views, wishes, and aspirations at the heart of, of the system and the culture change uh, required to do that. One of the casualties of this is that short breaks has slipped off the bottom of the agenda. Each area has its own sort of unique set of challenges, but time, energy and resources is, is one common factor. And, and short breaks, to some extent, particularly the area where it's not provided by a local authority, um, has come under risk, as it were. We can just see here some of the, the many different types of legislation which has come into effect recently. You know, we've got the CARE Act and, and, and the kind of the fact which we need to take into consideration is how does this impact on, on the way which forums can work with local authorities and health services to make sure that any services or policies or systems that are developed are done so uh, in that partnership way of working. And certainly for children, young people and families, some of the challenges may be just having an understanding of what the changes uh, mean for them, but also what the existing legislation says. It tends to be a practice in, in some cases that when areas are having to deal with new responsibilities, that they withdraw from some of that engagement and participation way of working. And that in some areas, it's a shift back perhaps to withdrawing services and having a deficit rather than an asset approach. There's also something around the aspect of social care and, and that obviously social care um, as a function is designed to support children and families and adults themselves where there is additional need. Um, but certainly from speaking to some families, just the whole fact that it's, it's part of that service provision, uh, that is short breaks, puts them off. And, and some families perhaps feel guilty from their responsibilities as a parent. And, and again, that's quite a sensitive area, but this may perhaps be a challenge. In terms of forums themselves, where they, have, where they are active and where they are um, engaged with local authority, then there's perhaps a challenge of just having the time and energy to do it, where, where forums are engaged, then local authorities are all too keen in most cases to be able to make use of them. And it's just about having the numbers, having the people available to kind of be involved. And perhaps the focus on the SEND reforms has meant that short breaks, again, has, has not necessarily had the same level of attention. Some, some parts, some areas don't necessarily value participation and the understanding around it isn't fully bedded in on, on how it provides good value for parties involved. And also, families have their own lives to lead. It's challenging enough, no doubt, to have children with additional needs, as well as being able to be involved in, in all of these other areas. And for councils, some of the issues are cycles of redundancies and restructures, where professionals, where, where, where officers within the council have an understanding of why these things are important. They don't necessarily have the balance of influence. So it's about getting people involved who have that balance of influence and understanding so that a sustained change can be uh, achieved. And, and where there's not perhaps the understanding of responsibilities under existing or the new legislation, there is a potential for unlawful practice. And these three areas tend to follow the kind of cycle of legislation or duties and responsibilities. 
the culture, that is the way um, things are done and the capability, the kind of time, energy and resources you have to achieve what's necessary. So how can forums get involved? Well, there's a really excellent resource available to forums in the form of the, the handbook. And this was, I think, published earlier in the year. And it really sets out in some very quite simple and to the point sections um, how forums can work with councils and health services to develop services, particularly with regard to short breaks. And one of the sections working in partnership looks at how government works in England, what the measures for recourse may be, and how you can influence and, and understand how those services work. And section five, looking at improving services, talks about pro-production, what that actually means, and how you can build relationships with key people so that they can gain an understanding of what families' needs are also, and how short breaks really provide excellent value. The uh, Children and Families Act sets out uh, four principles, which are general principles, which have a governing factor over how law works in practice. And this is applicable both in terms of individual cases, but also more widely um, in terms of how services are developed strategically. So these four principles are uh, local authorities must have regard to the views, wishes and feelings of families, the importance of those participating as fully as possible, and families being provided with the necessary information and support to enable that participation. So if we think about that in context of parent care forums, that's all about that partnership working and having meetings and information presented in, in the best possible way. What the SEND Code of Practice adds to this is principles in practice. And some of these are around the SEN or special educational needs uh, in particular, but it includes disability within that. So when we're thinking about short breaks, obviously they come into that context primarily. And what that sets out is that families are fully aware of their opportunities to offer views and information and are consulted when reviewing local special educational needs or disability social care provision and also within the development and review of their local offer. Now the local offer we've not touched on too much but in essence that a local offer is where councils and health services set out and publish information relating to the services they expect to be available within the area or in areas for which they have children who they're responsible for and that's services relating to special educational needs and disabilities so that would include short breaks in terms of a short break services statement that they detail the information in that setting out the information on, on the range of short break services should certainly be included as part of the local offer with regard to the principles in practice then then any changes to how services are delivered or accessed should be clear within both the local offer and the short break services statement and then the final point within the principles and practice talk about offering that information and advice relating to SEN and disability. Because of these issues, um, a piece of um, or, or, or some development work has been established through the short break partnership just to try and support children and families, parent care forums, commissioners and providers of short break services to help identify and promote the value of short break services and why they're beneficial. The Short Breaks Partnership is a consortium of Action for Children, Contact the Family, Cats for Disabled Children and Kids. And each of those separate organisations is supporting a particular group of people. The, the intention is that there's um, examples of best practice uh, identified and shared, guidance for each of the groups. So um, Action for Children are looking at developing resources for providers. Contact the Family are looking to support parent care reforms in terms of short breaks. Council for Disabled Children are providing and developing information for commissioners and kids are supporting better access to short breaks and information for children and young people. The other aspect that the Short Break Partnership is looking at is, is publishing that information regularly. So just recently we, we, we published the first bulletin which contains some of that information and includes some case studies. They're looking at the legal and policy aspects as well and to be able to see where if there are areas that are doing really, really well in the provision of short breaks, what other areas can learn from them. So in essence, it's looking at clarifying responsibilities, collating evidence, developing resources and supporting pain. Um, and this kind of like reflects quite well 
how participation has worked in practice, informing, consulting, participating, and co-producing. I mentioned the um, Short Breaks Partnership Bulletin, and if you click on the link when you get this circulated in the PDF, you'll be able to access that. And then four case studies we've got there for the particular audience are looking at ways in which short breaks are beneficial and some of the challenges which areas have faced. So for example, the contact the family case study looks at uh, the examples of, of where there are proposals to reduce the provision and what the forum did to um, work with the local authority to address some of those challenges. There are some other useful resources here and a lot of these are available on every Disabled Climate Matters website. But one which I think is, will be of, of real use to forums particularly is the Challenging Cuts to Short Break Services. This is an article written um, by Steve Broach and on behalf of Every Disabled Child Matters. And that looks at the legal precedent behind the provision of short break services. And there are some template letters in there which forums can use to write to the local authority and just um, look to initiate discussions and, and those areas where they can work together ensure that the services are protected where they're of real value. The contact the family link at the bottom there just links through to the web page which is where all of the case studies and bulletins will be published and any other information which is found throughout this project will be published there also. So we're very interested in hearing from areas where there are challenges. Um, we've got some questions which we're going to look to cover and if there's anything which we don't have time to or we're not able to answer it for, my email address is there and certainly uh, I think Helen's email address um, will be available for you to get in touch um, and yeah. So just going to go to some of the questions we've got already. So the question is to what age are the local authority obliged to provide short breaks? What replaces them in adult services? So if we think about this in terms of the context of um, where do short breaks sit? It is primarily, as far as the provision is concerned, a social care provision. Now, children's services, the legislation governing them and the way they're structured has tended to be from 0 to 18 for uh, social care and 18 plus for adult services in social care. With education, obviously that's changed from 0 to 19 to now within the SEND reform, 0 to 25, depending on the, uh, the particular circumstances of the family. So as far as local authorities are concerned, unless they've got properly joined up services, and some areas are doing this, they're bringing children and adult services together, they may only provide short breaks through children's services up until 18. Now, obviously, in terms of families' positions themselves, and, and what that means, then you would hope and expect that in practice that there would be some good planning around any transition to adult services. And certainly, if there's an assessment which identifies a particular need, which is well established and the services are being provided, then social care, if there's going to be any support provided within social care, would pick up on that and look to providing some sort of support with all those needs in, in, adult, in adult services. Now, obviously, the challenge it faces, if there isn't good transition, and if adult services don't necessarily agree with the assessment or the provision. And in, in practice, I mean, you know, some of the my experience I've, I've worked before as a commissioner is you have families who receive support with a particular um, care agency at a particular price, and adult services, you know, they agree to the provision, but they don't agree to the price. And, and this can all have an impact on families. But certainly the kind of the, the view to take is, is if there's an assessed need and if there's duty to provide services on the basis of that need, then there, there is there's kind of sufficient uh, reasoning to say that there would be some sort of similar provision within adult services and adulthood. Um, another question is, what redress do parents have if provision is unsatisfactory, i.e. if local provision does not cater for the needs of very complex children? This comes back to areas having an understanding of their population. Now, what we didn't touch on um, with the webinar so far is the responsibilities of health and wellbeing boards. Um, and they are the kind of high level governance for local authorities and health services. Um, health services have changed the way in which services are moved away from primary care trusts into 
what's called clinical commissioning groups. So they will have a, a, an arm of, of that service which commission services and an arm which provides services. And some of that will be provided by themselves and some of it will be provided by others. But in essence, the, the responsibilities are around about understanding the needs of the population in the area for which they're responsible. So we think where I live, Bedfordshire, is, is, a, is the county. And those responsible within Bedfordshire for with those duties, local authorities and CCGs, would need to understand what the needs of families are in that area. And that's not necessarily just relating to SEN and disability, that's all needs. And in terms of priorities, that's where the Health and Wellbeing Board would set out a strategy. And you'll be able to find this if you if you go onto the, the website and that'll identify what they see as the priorities. The joint strategic needs assessment is a tool which they use to get that understanding of the needs. So Say, for example, the question asked, if a local provision does not cater for the needs of very complex children, what I'm, I'm going to kind of suppose from that is that those needs are, are, are kind of quite clear in terms of being, being known and understood. It's all about having services which are sufficient to meet those needs. And that's where it's looking at, well, what's the long-term planning around this? Does it take into consideration what those needs are? And if that, that process around about understanding those needs, if that's not good enough, if that doesn't identify those, then perhaps there's discussions to be had there. In terms of a service is unsatisfactory, that depends on what that service is. There's different kind of legislation governing different types of service. If a service is provided by the local authority, there should be, under their registration and duties for officer, for example, um, a, a comeback process whereby people who receive services are able to say, you know, this isn't good. This, there's some concerns here. If it's provided by somebody, perhaps a community group, there still will be responsibilities. So, for example, for councils, if they commission that service or provide funding to, but they won't necessarily be in the same framework. But certainly, if there is um, if there is concerns or or feelings that service isn't good, what I would say is, in my position before as a commissioner. I would, have, I would have really welcomed hearing that. So perhaps it's, in this instance, it's finding out, is it a commission service? Is it something which is provided within the community? Is there some funding which they receive, perhaps? And then trying to find out who's, who kind of oversees that, that contract or, or the way that works and raising it with them. Um, as I said, when I worked as a commissioner, I would have really valued to hear that feedback. The next question is, by what process are short break providers chosen to be funded directly by the local authority? rather than by personal budgets? And is it a matter of public interest to sit on the selection panel for this process? Um, okay, so each area will have their own way of working in order to meet their legal duties and also to provide services in line with those. Local authorities and clinical commissioning groups also have a set of duties to adhere to with regard to being public bodies. So there are procurement regulations which set out what they need to do, say for example if they're putting out a tender or uh, a particular service provision, if the, if the contract value is over a certain threshold it has to be publicised in a certain way and there has to be due diligence in terms of any, any process where there are multiple applications. So if, if you're putting out a request for a new service of short breaks and you're asking people to apply to provide that service then the information needs to be clear, the process needs to be clear and fair so that there's no conflict of interest. If in this instance um, you're talking about a panel, um, I think, yes, then that should have its own governance process in place so that any of those areas which are unclear or where there could be uh, conflicting interests, there's a process to handle that so it's not um, it doesn't break any of those principles in terms of due diligence. As far as personal budgets are concerned, if a child and family have an assessed need um, relating to short breaks, they can request a personal budget or in most cases it's, it's referred to as a direct payment. So this tends to be at the minute around about support for them um, through having a personal assistant or somebody who would take their child out into the community to, to go through activities 
and it tends to be where the alternative provision, which a local authority would would make available, would be something like a domiciliary care agency. Now, there's no requirement for families to have a personal budget, and certainly in the SEND reforms, there's a separate set of regulations which talks about personal budgets, um, and the fact that families have the right to request one. But the legislation also talks about there's a number of considerations which need to be um, satisfied, I guess, in terms of what local areas feel they're able to make available through a personal budget. We don't have time to go through that now, but the regulations do set that out, that certainly families have the right to request one, and, and, and also with social care. But it's not something which should just be offered as this is your only choice. Hopefully that answers the question. If it doesn't, email me. Um, so the next question, is there an independent body or ombudsman that oversees the whole service? What can parents do if they feel their allocation, either in terms of personal budget or days allocated, does not reflect the child or family's level of need? So just to kind of split that into two questions, is there an independent body or ombudsman? Well, each local authority um, will have a complaint process which should be publicised on their website and it should set out what the staged approach, because there usually be different levels and um, what to do if you're not happy with a particular thing, and that information should be made available. In terms of wider than that, then obviously they are um, they will have duties towards Ofsted, and again, that is an option to perhaps raise concerns with. That would probably be after you've followed through on the complaint or process or grievance process. And then in addition to that, there is also the local government ombudsman which you'll probably be able to find if, if you Google that. So that should, those areas should be able to provide a further aspect of recourse if you're not happy with the um, complaints process. But what I would expect that each of those, um, you know, different bodies will, will want to see is really that the um, kind of the, the complaints process has been followed in the first instance. So in terms of what families can do if they feel that their allocation does not reflect their child or family's level of need. Now, let's say, for example, the child has a social care child in need assessment. Again, within the legislation, that talks about that assessment being reviewed. I think it's every six months. But certainly, if there's anything that changes within those needs, then the family's perfectly entitled to, to a request a, a further reassessment of those needs. The assessment... If it's, if it's comprehensive, should identify what those needs are, what the outcomes are looking to achieve, and how a degree of support enables those to be met. If they don't, then it sounds like it's, it's about requesting a further reassessment of those needs. In terms of personal budget or days allocated, now, I forget the year, but I think it was in 2002 or 2008, there's some legislation governing direct payment. And um, we've mentioned that personal budget is, is, is referenced within the new legislation. But what the new legislation says, which the old legislation perhaps was slightly unclear on, is, well, if there is to be a personal budget, it should cover the cost of provision rather than the charge. So say, for example, we, we gave the example of auxiliary care agencies. Now, they perhaps have an hourly rate of between sort of 17 to 25 or 30 pounds an hour. I know because I used to work as a commissioner. And a family might receive an allocation of a number of hours through a personal budget, but what the monetary value of that is equated on what the hourly rate in most areas of, of what the uh, personal assistant would receive plus national insurance and um, inland revenue of tax um, on top of it. So it doesn't necessarily marry up in terms of equivalency, whereas what the new regulations does say is that if there is a personal budget in place, that it should reflect the cost. So we've got another couple of questions come in. How do we get short breaks for the under eights? Insurance seems to be the common barrier due to lack of it, apparently. I'm not sure of the specific area where um, it relates to whether it's, it's childcare settings or, or what have you. Ofsted have refreshed their regulations governing this, and I think the age of eight was where if support is given to a child under eight, they needed to be on the compulsory register whereas after that it was about being on the on the voluntary register. Now certainly as a commissioner before I would always expect or, or, or kind of anticipate that most people providing a degree of support for children, particularly if they have additional needs, um, have the necessary skills, experience and, and, and processes in place, including insurance, 
make sure that they're looking after that child well. Uh, and that would include any professional registration or, or, or being registered with people like OSED or CQC. So if there's a challenge where children under eight aren't receiving the chalk break, they obviously still have uh, have those needs, have the need for a short break. And again, I would look to perhaps initiate conversations with those responsible for commissioning services within that area and, and to try and highlight, to get an understanding, is this a common issue or is it perhaps just um, around about a unique circumstance? What perhaps is slightly underutilized in a lot of areas is the use of, of card minders. And again, these would tend to be offset registered and, and back where I used to work, you have a number of the child minders who, who had taken on additional training and, and were, were more able to support children with additional needs and disabilities, and, and that included um, egg feeding, it included awareness, and, and all of those other things. The child care provision is also an area of responsibility for local authorities, and you may, may find if you contact them or the family information service, they might have some information on what child minders are registered with them and what child minders um, are able to support children with more um, complex needs. And I think it's a national organisation, AC, who oversees that as well, and they may have some information out on, on the websites. In addition to that, a lot of the voluntary set groups who provide short breaks and um, tend to have some sort of support um, for all age ranges, and, and certainly with the, with the younger groups, that might be more around about family support altogether, so um, one of the one of the areas I worked in, uh, they had a, a Saturday morning um, short break service where families went along. There was a, there was a kind of a tea and coffee room, and the children were supported by support workers who like did lots of fun activities. So it's not a break in the same way as, as a separate one. But if you feel that a need's not being met, you certainly have the right to request an assessment under the social care legislation. Okay, so the next question is. Is there a definition for reasonably practical as referred under the duty to provide by the local authority in the code of practice? Um, yeah, I, I quite like um, trying to drill down into some of these subjective terms which are used. And I think what we'll see with the SEND reforms is that where there are areas which isn't clear entirely, it will be clarified through the case law process so people will perhaps challenge and there will be some sort of precedent set by that going to judicial review and further clarity being established through that or additional guidance coming out. In terms of reasonably practical, my understanding of that would be, is it something which other areas are doing, does it work, does it meet the statutory duties and is it good value for money? We mentioned that local authorities and CCGs have a duty in terms of um, being public bodies to spend money effectively. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's something that's cheap, and certainly in terms of procurement, they tend to have a cost-benefit analysis. With children's services, and particularly where there are additional needs and disabilities, cheap is not good necessarily, but then equally expensive is not good either. So it's about finding the, the, the kind of the point of value where, where services are really responsive and, and and meet families' needs well. So as far as being reasonably practical um, is concerned, it's about looking at some of those other factors. If there's a duty to provide something and and that, that's based upon assessed needs or the needs of families um, collectively, perhaps identified through a joint strategic needs assessment and other areas are doing it, then that would seem to set some sort of precedent. And again, hopefully that's answered it. I think some of these terms aren't necessarily as clear as you would hope, and certainly another area where those terms, those subjective terms were used was with the Equality Act, which talks about similar things, and, and what was done with that is that there was additional guidance given, which gave some examples um, of where something was reasonably practical. So for example, with that, it talks about, the Equality Act talks about the nine separate characteristics, protected characteristics, which includes disability. And some of the guidance looks at the steps which are reasonably practical by schools, for example, to take in terms of supporting children with disabilities. So we have an addition question. A question. Okay. Okay. So it's 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 more about the kind of range of services that are provided um, by local authorities, and if a particular um, group of children is not being provided for. And I think we had a, a question um, before which looked at if those children are under a certain 
um, age and whether or not there are prescriptive factors which are being put forward as reasons why services aren't being provided. So, for example, if it's under eight and insurance being a factor. So, again, I would say if there's children who aren't being provided a service, particularly you know if it's been set out that way, that doesn't necessarily meet the terms that the short breaks regulation sets out in terms of a range of services. Because those children who are under eight and those families still meet the criteria by definition of being carers of children with additional needs and disabilities. So how can those carers be supported to continue to provide care if there's no range of services that's sufficient to meet those needs? And if, if there's a blanket kind of policy statement saying we don't provide support for those under eight, that doesn't necessarily seem to be consistent with that. Again, I, I wouldn't want to kind of say categorically until I look at the details of perhaps with that one. If you want to email me with some of the details, um, we can have a look at that in, in, in further. But yes, yeah, certainly it doesn't necessarily sound um, altogether right. Um, no more questions. Okay. So um, thank you for your time today. Hopefully it's been of use. The slides were jumping forwards and backwards, so just apologies for that. I'm still getting used to this computer. We've got the feedback which will launch at the end of the slideshow just to demonstrate that there. Please take some time to complete this. If you have any particular points in terms of short breaks, I think question 13 gives you the option to just kind of record that down. Alternatively, if you've got my contact details, um, if you wanted to get in touch. This, this kind of the short breaks partnership in terms of contact plan is around supporting parent care report. Just bear that in mind if there's particular areas and we will be looking to develop some further resources to support forms in relation to that. Thank you.